Good afternoon or good evening. The June 19, 2018 meeting of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners will come to order and we are pleased to have Mr. Joe Fowler of the Hartley, Rowe and Fowler firm here with us this evening to lead us in our invocation. After the invocation, please remain standing for our pledge to the flag. Good evening, everyone. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come together tonight to consider the business of the people of this county. And as we do so, we pause for a moment to thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for your promise that when we seek wisdom, you will provide it. And we now ask that for each of the members of the Board of Commissioners, their staff, their council, for any other elected officials who will participate, for the employees of the county who will provide input, and for all of those who have business before the Board tonight. We thank you that we live in a country where we are permitted to safely come together in meetings to appear before those of us who have been entrusted with leadership positions like the commissioners here tonight. And we pledge never to take this privilege lightly, and we'll do all that in our power, all in our power to engage one another kindly and civilly and openly. We thank you for our county, for the leaders who lead us tonight. Bless them now as we meet in your name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fowler, for being here and leading us in our invocation this evening. And good evening again, and we're delighted that you've joined us, and we uh, appreciate your participation in local government. Public comment, clerk, do we have anybody tonight? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we have one individual who signed up tonight. And before I call your name, I just would like to state we respect our citizens' right to address their government in this meeting. However, I, enforce to, uh, I intend to enforce the three-minute rule in order for this meeting to run efficiently and effectively. Once you reach your three minutes, and uh, I will ask you to wrap your sentence up, and then I will take the floor back. Please remember that your comments by rule must be limited to things germane to this agenda. Please avoid campaigning or personal attacks against personnel or officials which should be handled in another forum other than a business meeting of this body. And our first uh, citizen on uh, this uh, document is Mr. J uh, John Tomaski. Mr. Tomaski, would you please come forward? And when you come forward, please give us your address and your subject matter. And I see you subject uh, item number six and number 10. That's what you're, good morning, good evening, I'm sorry. Good evening, good evening everyone. Uh, John Tomaski, 2929 Post Road, uh, Unit 432. And I am here to speak to items 6 through 10. Oh, 6 through 10. And I am pleased to see these items on the agenda because they reflect the will of the Commission to deal with the humanistic problems of the local population. I commend the Vice Chairman, Commissioner Robinson, for holding that role for the last several years. And I commend the chairwoman for giving her support to these efforts. And I commend each of the four district commissioners who will vote in favor of these items as part of the consent agenda. Good evening to all. Thank you. Mr. Tomaski, we appreciate you, uh, your participation in county government, and we will take this matter under advisement. We have a presentation tonight, and it is uh, uh, Splash Update is our first presentation. Mr. Rich Boulain, welcome. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Board of Commissioners. Good My name is Rich Bolane. I'm with Moreland Altabelli Associates, and I'm here to give you the June update of the 2016 SPLOSH program. Uh, starting with the budget, you can see uh, the, the program was $106 million, and right now uh, in the blue, which is transportation, which is 51%, uh, we're at $30.6 million basically budgeted in the program. 
Fire EMS is the red. Uh, their original was 32 million. We're at 31.3 in the budget, and that's basically just assigning dollars to projects. Parks and Recreation, 17 percent. We're at 16.9, and then the program management fee, we're at 4.2 over the six years. Just here showing the spend plan versus the planned spend plan versus actual uh, fire EMS. We're about $4.3 million we've spent to date. Transportation, uh, we're about $4.4 million. And then parks and recreation, we're just under $300,000 on parks and rec. Uh, program management, you can see the curve going up, but then it drops down. That's the issue of a second task order for splash year number two. So we'll start tracking that. Uh, next slide basically is the uh, estimated revenues collected versus actuals. The straight line across the top is the beginning of splash year number two, which we started collecting in April. The actual collection was $1,938,000, just below that. Our expectation, if you remember last year, was just below $2 million. We, using a weak <coughs> economic growth model, so we added 1% to last year's number. 1% of $2 million is about $20,000. So our, our new revenue target is $2,016,000 per month. We'll be tracking that every, every month. Uh, what you see here, we're about $78,000 behind. This is just the beginning. We're showing April, the first collection. And then the real information's right here. Again, looking for $2,016,000 per month. Uh, the first month we collected one million nine thirty seven, uh, a difference of seventy eight seventy nine thousand dollars. So we'll be tracking that on a monthly basis and reporting to you every month on that. Bond payment, uh, bond payment for splash year number two is the red number in the middle, seventeen point six nine million dollars. Our first payment is due in October, one point three million, and then our second payment is due April of next year, sixteen million. Again, we, every penny that we collect right now is being held in an account until we reach that $17.669 million so that we have enough money to meet our bond obligations. Moving into the projects, fire EMS, first project is the uh, digital radio system. That's the $16 million project. Uh, they're about 13% complete, finalizing the tower site locations and then the uh, foundations and everything associated with the towers. You'll see later on in the uh, agenda, there's two change orders coming your way. One is for a credit, one is for additional expenses. Between the two, it's uh, roughly about a hundred and some odd thousand dollar cost savings to the county right now. Next project is the ambulance procurement. Uh, two ambulances are on order and we expect them by the end of this calendar year. Same thing with the fire truck. The fire truck. Uh, has gone to C&P, it'll hit the street for procurement, and we're expecting delivery of that fire truck by the end of the year also. Station three renovations, it's been, uh, we received six bids on June 15th. Those bids are in review. I'll tell you the numbers are better than they were with the previous bid, but they're in review, and we'll be bringing a recommendation to the board uh, probably in next month. New fire station signage, that job is complete. The last sign was installed. We've uh, processed all the invoice, so this will be the last time you see that. We'll close that project out. And then the staff vehicles, uh, Chief has three vehicles on order for this year. Uh, they're on order and we expect delivery by the end of the calendar year. Moving into transportation, uh, resurfacing program for 2018. Bids were received on June 8th. We received four bids. Uh, they were great numbers, and you'll see later in the agenda the recommendation to award to the contractor to do the 2018 resurfacing program. Sorry. Riverside Parkway street lights, the pole, the, all the poles are up. All the lights aren't functioning yet. We'll get the power turned on, get those lights operational, and then we'll close that out. Lee Road extension study, the study's ongoing. Uh, results should be later this fall, and the change order to uh, to the contractor has been processed, so uh, they're moving forward on that work also. Riverside Parkway Rock House Road traffic signal. The signal is in operation. Uh, there's still a variable message sign out there, but uh, we'll get that sign out of there and then we'll process the last invoices and close out that project also. 
Stewart Mill Road, uh, Reynolds Road, Jacobs Engineering. Uh, we've reached an agreement with them, just waiting on the executed contract from uh, C&P with uh, Bill, uh, Bill Peacock. So uh, as soon as we get that, we'll get that started. Bright Star Road at John West. That is about 60% designed at this point in time. Completion later this summer, and we will move forward with the bids probably in the fall. Sweetwater Church, Doris Road. Uh, if you remember, Douglas County did the uh, signal design, traffic signal design. Paulding County did the civil design. We have since taken our traffic signal design, sent it over to Paulding County. They are incorporating it into their plans to make sure our pole locations for the traffic signals fit within the widening section and within the right-of-way. So that's ongoing, and I know Miguel's working on an intergovernmental agreement of how we're moving forward, uh, who does what, and how we get the rest of the project done. Chapel Hill Road intersections, uh, about 30% complete with the design. We're in the process of getting a meeting set up out along the alignment with the neighborhoods out there so that the public can come see the plan, see what it looks like, and uh, that should be taking place within the next month. But the design, 30% uh, done, looking for a late fall completion. Highway 5, Douglas Boulevard. Uh, I know Miguel's researching uh, right away and what's out there now, so that's ongoing. And we've applied, I, I know it shows $1,000 there, it's since been changed, but we've put more money to it after last month's meeting where we're gonna take some of the splash money to buy the right of way for the two left turn lanes, uh, the GDOT project. So that'll be incorporated into this project too. Highway 92, Anawakey Road. Uh, what we're doing now is researching the uh, scope of work. So we'll work with Miguel on uh, getting a scope of work uh, study to get uh, to nail that down and come up with a detailed scope of work. Three uh, schools, sidewalk jobs, Lithia Springs, Chestnut Log Middle, and New Manchester High School. SEI, Southeast Engineering, is the design firm on all three. Uh, just waiting on the executed contract, and I believe we have a design kickoff meeting this Thursday at one o'clock. So uh, we'll get SEI started on those three projects. They will design them concurrently. They'll be working on all three at the same time. Uh, so we'll get those done. And then the transportation equipment uh, purchase in a, right now we've got a couple of pickup uh, dump trucks with snow removal equipment on order. Expect delivery by the end of this calendar year. And that's it for transportation. Moving into parks and rec. First one is the Boundary Waters restroom concession stand. Uh, bids are due July 13th, so uh, we're waiting on construction bids for that. Soccer field light, we're gonna marry that project up with the concession stand, do both at the same time. So uh, we'll package those together. Deer Lick Park tennis courts, uh, we uh, We've got a recommended A&E, and it'll be coming before you in July, so we'll be looking to get your uh, approval on the architect engineer for that work next month. And then the multi-purpose rec center, uh, we had a design kickoff, Sutton Engineering, Sutton Architecture is the A&E, and they are starting work on that. And then uh, I know we'll have public meetings once we get the first preliminary plans, about 15% level of effort on the design. We'll have some public meetings down on site so that the uh, uh, patrons can see what it looks like. The senior center is about a month behind the rec center. Uh, we still need to get the executed contract and have a kickoff meeting on that. So that's about a couple of weeks away. And then Bill Arp and Fair Play Park. Uh, the design is ongoing. They're about 60% design, 60% complete with the design, and we'll be looking to go out for construction bids on those buildings later this summer. Uh, equipment purchases for Parks and Rec. They had a $100,000 budget. We've, we've got a couple of infield machines, a couple of mowers, a pickup, and then we have a new control system for the aquatic center, uh, which maintains the HVAC, the HVAC system and the chemical release into the pools. So that's gonna be, uh, those are all on order. Some of them are in. Uh, that's the equipment purchases for parks. And then our program management expenses, you can see the blue, we're just, uh, we'll track our exact expenses to the task order that you've given us. And 
that's it for June, if, unless you have any questions. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Guida. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Rich, uh, yes, ma when you let the resurfacing contracts, do we retain any millings? I don't know. Uh, Miguel, do we uh, keep the millings or do they go back to the plant for recycling? Is that in the contract that we will keep the millings? Because we use the millings on dirt roads. That's why I was asking. They're good for shoulder stabilization, too. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So you're saying they are, it, we will retain the millings? Okay. Very good. We need it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Do you yield back? Commissioner? You yield back? Oh, I'm sorry. I yield back. Okay. I was just wondering, <laughs> making sure. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Bolang, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, again, I, I want to acknowledge, I know sometimes this gets mundane as we go through it now and we're into our second year. So for the public, uh, again, the Board of Commissioners, thank you for entrusting us with stewardship over this SPLOST. Um, um, again, it is an important tool uh, to fulfill your expectations of us as representatives of you. So again, I've got to acknowledge that. Uh, it's a lot of responsibility. We appreciate the commitment of Rich Boulain and uh, Moreland Russell for overseeing this for us, as well as our staff. I mean, it's a lot of moving parts with this, a lot of simultaneous projects, and we're just getting started, and it's complex. And some of you who have project management skill sets or understand how to manage things, I mean, you can appreciate what needs to be done here. So um, kudos again, stay on task, um, keep us on budget. We'll keep our eyes on the digest. Um, yep. I mean, as raised to tax dollars, so we'll get there. Here's my question for you, Rich. Um, this goes back into yesterday's conversation regarding SR 92 and Anawiki. Uh, we did have conversations. Um, Miguel, Valentin, please, can you come down and join us, please? Um, this will be related. Um, and it's only because it came up yesterday during the work session that there was a consideration to sort of skip over it uh, for the citizens who, who had vested interest in this um, and move on to the next project. So Miguel, can we talk about what we discussed in the uh, Transportation Committee today and also as a quick briefing for, as courtesy for Commissioner Mulcair, please? Absolutely. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioner. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the discussion at the Transportation Committee was essentially the project envisions a realignment of the road uh, at State Route 92, and uh, we first need to embark in a, an assessment phase, a scoping phase. So what we intend to do is uh, uh, draft the documents to be able to go out and procure uh, a consultant to do the scoping phase, which analyzes the alternatives that may be available. And they also come up with uh, some preliminary cost. And uh, then we will present back to the board. At that point, we will have a, a uh, uh, not only the alignment, but a cost associated with the next phase. And so there will be a decision point for the board as to whether you want to embark on uh, the recommended alternative or uh, some other uh, approach. So that's what we intend to do at this point. Um, and, and, and to that point, um, County Administrator, you mentioned something that, I mean, the, the solution was, and, and again, the context was Riverside Parkway dead ends right now onto Fairburn Road, SR 92. However, for those who are familiar with the district areas that if you're going north from Highway 166 right there um, at Lower River Road, um, um, which is going down a hill, or you're coming the other way from Publix and you get by Anawaki and you go down that hill, there's congestion, there's concern about speed. I mean, it's like Frogger. You got to know how to jump out there and get across. And it's very dangerous going across four lanes like that. And so we, it, people were frustrated with that. And probably, I mean, at the time, it supported what it supported. But you've got trucks that come along there. Um, you've got a high degree of travel. And so the expectation was, well, can we get a light there? And the initial response was, you can't have three lights that close together. I don't know if that's true. This is not, that's why staff is here. This is more of an engineering, an administrative issue. It's not a political or legislative, but yet, because it's part of the slots, we have to sort of weigh in as it relates to dollars. So the question is, do we realign 
Riverside and cut through that hill over to Anawake, or do we put a light? Those were the considerations way back when, prior to be, um, uh, Miguel Valentin, prior to um, uh, Mark Teal, per se. So what I'm going to do is stop there, and I ask uh, politely if my colleague, uh, Madam Chair, at your pleasure, Commissioner Walker can weigh in on this. I want to yield my time, because I think this is relevant to, to give direction, and I yield, Madam Chair. Okay. Commissioner Walker, would you like yes, to weigh in? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I concur. Uh, this is clearly a problem slash uh, safety issue and, uh, and along with the ever increasing traffic flows and I, I foresee ever increasing truck traffic flows as, as the Savannah Harbor gets up to full steam surprisingly that will have an impact on Douglas County and uh, the issue of placement and, and sequence and the relationship between the, the two existing traffic signals and adding one there uh, is one uh, is a consideration, a real consideration, of whether it would meet uh, DOT standards and and would add or, or create problems, I, I guess we could say. So I would like, I concur with the chairman, transportation chairman uh, Robinson, that we um, uh, look at this, uh, take a, at least an internal study uh, of, of the area and see what the most plausible solutions would be uh, relative to monies that are available. So uh, uh, I, I, I want us to look at that. So thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Okay. Madam Chair, you had all time back. Okay. Commissioner Guider. May I ask a question about this? Uh, this is, uh, if it's the intersection I'm thinking of, it's where 166 turns down to 92, and you're talking about aligning a, a Riverside Parkway into that intersection and putting a light there. It, well, there's a light already there, right? No. Uh, yeah, but I anyway, uh, when you were show, talking about it yesterday, I just noticed it's just $1,000 allocated in the splash for that. So this is just mm -hmm. for a scope because this is a, um, does involve a state highway, so we need to be making application to the state DOT to, to uh, you know, maybe put this on their project list, right? That thousand dollars, I assigned that thousand dollars just as we got started. We had some advertisement of, you know, like newspaper ads and things like that. So I put a thousand dollars there just for now. If we have to do an alignment study or an alignment project, it's yeah, a lot you're more. talking about a lot more money. Yes, so I just, I just wondered, are we uh, talking about getting it put on a project list with DOT since it is uh, uh, two state roads right there? Well, uh, Commissioner, uh, I think the, the, the way the discussion has been uh, defined up to now, we envision that the initial phase, the scoping phase, analyzing, looking at alternatives, and developing preliminary cost estimates would be done through SPLOST. Then uh, the next step, which would be a design of the preferred alternative, if that is the pleasure of the board to move forward, then a decision would have to be made at that time. Is it a project that uh, is within the means or within the budget of, of the SPLOS program this time around, or whether it needs to be coupled with federal funding? But those decisions will come later. The initial uh, stage, the scoping phase study, uh, would involve certainly more than a thousand dollars. Yes. But um, do you have any kind of idea of what, what, what I, kind of money you're talking about, <laughs> uh, Commissioner? I have I have some idea, uh, but I don't want to broadcast it okay. to the uh, consultants <laughs> that might be listening. But it does involve the state DOT since the two uh, highways merge right there. Right? We would certainly have to coordinate with them and let them know what we are doing. They However, would. they would not be uh, necessarily engaging, uh, reviewing, or approving the initial phase. The scoping study would be done strictly by the county. Any steps beyond that certainly would involve the state. But they wouldn't be on board with paying part of it since uh, it, it's also a safety issue because of the trucks that Commissioner Robinson mentioned coming out of there and then trying to make a turn over that hill I mean, there's a kind of a blind hill coming over there that they would not see if the traffic were stopped for a truck to pull out there. Okay. Uh
procedurally if we wanted to um, go that route, uh, having uh, interaction with and participation by the uh, Georgia DOT, uh, we would have to await the next uh, call for projects for mm -hmm. funding, which will come next year. Okay. And so the issue becomes, do we want to wait till then or do we want to move forward with this initial scoping on our own um, in, with the anticipation that if there's any further uh, design and, and eventually construction and right of way acquisition, uh, that that could involve uh, the Georgia DOT. My, my sense is that um, the project will be a pretty sizable project that you may want to consider at that point engaging the Georgia DOT. Yes. Okay, I yield back. Um, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, d just as a point of clarity, and again, for, for, for District 2 uh, residents, um, Madam Guider brought up a good point. I, I wasn't, my, my courtesy was saying not responding to her was that it had to go back to obviously staff because she had the floor and I couldn't interrupt. Um, but importantly, remember, we're talking about, what we're at, uh, Madam Guider talked about 166 and 92. That's where Lower River Road was. That's the original street that goes right there by the cemetery, by the high school, I mean, excuse me, the elementary school, and the church, right? That road was pretty much cut off, and Riverside was built to avoid going down there because it was too much traffic. If you go along there, it snakes along, it's too small, it's too limited. And so, again, um, we're not talking about that side, that bite. We're talking about cutting through the hill on Riverside over to Anawaki, the other light. Right, to, so again, we're going this way versus this way, right? So that's, I, I wanted to clarify so there was no confusion because again, we're not gonna cut through a church and cemetery and, and try to align that, that, I mean, we're going backwards 40 years. We're going the other way and so I think that's important. I won't belabor this, but I think, to, to Commissioner Molker's point, let's just study it, but it was on the list. If it comes out to be sort of cost prohibitive, I think the board can make that call at a collective level. Um, but it's already on the list and it's in, you know, above the line in essence. So I yield, Madam Chair. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Bolain or um, Director Valentin? Thank you. All right. Next, our next presentation, we have a, the 2017 audit presenta presentation by Malden and Jenkins. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Thanks for, for, for allowing me to present the, the results of the audit of the financial statements. It's um, maybe not nearly as exciting as SPLOS projects. You <laughs> said that SPLOS projects are mundane. Maybe you get those every month, but it's still more exciting probably to talk about you know, new things that are coming and things that are happening right now as opposed to looking back a year. But that doesn't make the audit any less important. And so uh, I appreciate you giving me the time to present uh, the results. I'm going to talk from, from this presentation, which is on your screens. You also have it uh, handed out as well. Uh, I will um, talk very briefly about our engagement team. I'll go over the overall results of the audit. We'll have some financial trends included, uh, and then we'll get into some comments and recommendations, uh, and we'll have time for questions um, at the end or throughout if you prefer. Uh, I, I do um, want to take a minute, though. This was our first year as the auditor uh, of the county. And first year transition years can be very tough and difficult on, on us, but especially on, on the county staff. And I wanted to thank them for making this really, as transition audits go, first year audits go, very smooth audit. Um, they always have their bumps here and there, but the county staff, and that includes constitutional officer staff, everybody at the county, but in particular, the, the finance department did a really good job responding to all the requests we have, and we look at things sometimes differently, maybe in more detailed than others, and just thank them for, for dealing with us very professionally and getting things to us very quickly and, and, and still having the audit process work very smoothly. So it was a very smooth and good audit, very clean, as you'll, you'll see. Um, but, but I just wanted to mention that uh, from the beginning. 
Um, the, the, having said that, the financial statements actually technically aren't issued yet. They will be issued in the next week to week and a half. Um, I am, I'm, my name is Joel Black. I should probably introduce myself. I'm the audit partner, was in charge of the audit of the financial statements, everything that happened. I've reviewed everything and, and I'm good with the numbers, so I'm satisfied these are the results of the audit. It just is still going through our quality assurance process and then getting printed. So within the next week, at most week and a half, they'll be out. And certainly if you get them and you would like to have uh, a discussion about them or have questions about them, I'll be glad to answer those later. But I did include some financial trends in here that pull from the, the financial statements that I think kind of present, you know, useful information. Uh, just a little bit about us uh, as a firm, as a, as a reminder, or kind of as an introduction. Um, Malden Jenkins government is a big part of what we do. Uh, it's about a quarter of the firm. All I work with are state and local governments. That's all the clients I have, everybody on, on the team that worked with the county, that's all they work with. We audit more counties in Georgia than anybody, more cities in Georgia than anybody. We audit eight of the 10 largest counties in the state. So government's a, a, a big part of what we do, and we certainly are very qualified to, to audit the financial statements of the county. Uh, here are kind of our objectives and then our overall results. Our objectives were to make sure we followed all the applicable auditing standards generally, except that auditing standards, government auditing standards, uh, which means our objective was to make sure that the financial statements as presented by management are materially correct for the year ended 12-31-17 in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, and our overall result or report was an unmodified opinion or a clean opinion says the financials are materially correct. That's the opinion you would hope to receive and what you did receive. Uh, in addition to the financial statement audit, we did what's called a single audit, which is a federal grant compliance audit. When you expend a certain amount of money, you have to have some of your federal grant programs looked at from a compliance perspective. We had to look at one major program this year, which was the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. And um, our opinion on compliance for that uh, program was also unmodified or clean. So overall, those are very good results. That's what you would hope to get and what you did get. So, so good, good results and clean opinions. Moving on to some of our other um, communications. Uh, significant accounting policies as a board, I would want to know, do I have any unusual or aggressive accounting policies? Uh, anything that I could be, should be concerned about and you don't have any, they're all disclosed in your notes to your financials, but they're all very typical standard accounting policies that we see at our other county governments in Georgia and throughout the Southeast. So nothing unusual there. Uh, estimate wise, there are more kind of in accordance with GASB, the generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, there are more estimates in financials. The two bigger ones you have are an allowance for doubtful accounts. So try, trying to net down a receivable for some estimate of the amount of that receivable that you may not collect. Uh, and so just kind of netting down that receivable through an allowance. We looked at that one. And then your actuarial assumptions that lead to your actuary pension liability and OPEB liabilities. Um, those are very important assumptions. We looked at those pretty closely, felt good about the the assumptions that were used, the information in the past that was used to create the, the current year estimates. And so we did spend time with those and felt good about the ones that management used and uh, that they were good estimates. Uh, on this slide, the relationship with management, just as a board, I, this would be one of the more important ones I would wanna know. Uh, the, process worked the way it was supposed to. Uh, we felt like we had access to anything. We didn't feel like anything was hidden from us. Anytime we asked for something, management worked to get it very quickly and did get it very quickly to us. We didn't have any disagreements with management. They were very open to any suggestions, requests, recommendations that we had. So that worked re really very well uh, and you should feel good in how open and, and how that process worked. Audit adjustment wise, um, if you took kind of the trial balances that we got originally, there were a few audit adjustments or really adjustments to them. Most of those actually came from the county finance department themselves as they kind of continued the close out of the books. There were a couple of audit adjustments that we found. Those will be talked about a little bit later in the presentation, but for the most part, uh, it was very clean and we just had those couple of audit adjustments that we'll discuss later. The most important thing probably on this slide is independence. Uh, we meet all the applicable independent standards, so we're independent of the county and any related organization. We don't do anything else for the county or any other related entity except audit financial statements. So that's all we do, no consulting or anything like that. So we do meet all those standards. All right, so moving on to um, some of our financial trends. Um, this is, these will focus on the general fund. Uh, our audit encompassed all of the funds of the county. Um, and so even though this, th these, 
historical trends really focus on the general fund, which is probably your most important fund. It's not that we didn't audit the others. We did audit all, all the funds in the county. Um, this uh, slide shows your major tax revenues, which are the kind of largest revenues of the county. And you can see um, property taxes there in the gold bar at the top and then lost or local option sales taxes at the bottom. And the property taxes went up with, when you had a, a, a millage increase back in 2013. And since then have fluctuated a little bit really as your assessments go up, but as your millage rate has actually trended down some to compensate for that. And you'll see that more on the next slide actually. And the loss, the local option sales taxes, this is really not reflective that the sales tax overall is lessening because it actually is increasing as the economy in the county grows, but you're sharing more of that each year with the cities because their percentage as required is, is increasing slightly every year. So the county portion is decreasing a little bit every year, leading to that pretty steady, but a little bit less um, revenue from the lost every year because of that decrease in percentage. Uh, here's the property tax slide I mentioned, you can see there the gold is the assessed values that kind of were still trending down a little bit in the early part of this trend, but are actually going up pretty significantly the last several years. And then as a result, you've been able to reduce the millage and keep property tax revenue, you know, relatively consistent. It bounces around a little bit, but for the most part, pretty consistent by kind of taking that assessed value and relating that into a, a reduction in the millage rate. Here you can see your general fund expenditures and where you spent them by, by, by function. Uh, most of it, 39% in public safety, 23% general governmental, 17% um, on, on judicial. That's what you would expect to see at a county government with the, the majority of the revenue being spent on public safety and judicial combined. Um, so that's a very kind of typical spread that we see with a lot of our governments, county governments at least. Here are general fund expenditures and fund balance and the trends. Um, you can see that the expenditures have, have been, you know, relatively steady, bounced up and down a little bit. There's a relatively significant increase this past year, uh, and that comes a little bit across the board. The biggest reason for that increase was two to two and a half million of renovation costs to the building you acquired back in 2015. So that was a large part of that increase. The rest of it was kind of spread throughout various functions where predominantly public safety and the courts and sheriff uh, had more filled positions or, or added positions in the budget, that sort of thing. So there were budgeted increases or, or filling of, of vacant positions that kind of spread the rest of that cost uh, expenditure increase uh, among various functions. Uh, fund balance uh, has shrunk as a result really of these kind of expenditures increasing, but really I'm gonna talk about it in a little bit more uh, a result somewhat or maybe even more largely because of the transfers out. Uh, this, I think, is maybe a better way to look at fund balance. Uh, and this is if you talk to rating agencies, those types, this is a ratio they would tell you they look at to look at the financial stability, evaluate the financial stability of a government. And this takes your general fund fund balance as a percentage of expenditures for that year. Uh, rating aid analysts have told me they'd like to see for a large county government maybe two to three months worth of expenditures in fund balance, which would be 16 to 25% maybe a mid-sized county like yours, three to four months, maybe a smaller county, four to six months, something like that. Your ratio being 31% is something a little less than, than four months. You're at 3.8 or something like that. So you're right in kind of the ratio that I think people would like to see for a government your size. So kind of fund balance, not too big, not too small, kind of just right. So I think it's trended down a little bit, um, really as a result of the transfers, and we'll talk about that more in the next slide. Uh, but I think that's something that you wouldn't want to continue for much longer, uh, but certainly where you are now is a good spot um, and just something to pay attention to that trend, but where you are now is, is, is a good, good shape for fund balance for the general fund. Um, here are the changes in fund balance in the general fund over the last couple of years. So you can see those reductions the last couple of years. And in particular, when you look at 2017, the revenue, revenues and expenditures were actually very balanced. It was the net transfers out to other funds that kind of created that $3.7 million reduction in fund balance. And of those transfers, about a million or a little more than a million was to the capital improvements fund. So it was capital, doesn't necessarily have to continue every year. And then um, about one and a half million of it was um, for, to fund a, a kind of deficit in the arterial road capital projects fund that I'll talk about and when I get to the findings. Um, but that certainly kind of cleared that up and won't continue, won't have to happen. So if you look at the fact that two and a half million of those 
transfers don't necessarily have to happen again. You know, it's not that much to, to adjust to get that to, to a balanced perspective. All right, so moving now on to our comments and recommendations, and these are the findings that we had, things that we consider to be uh, at least significant enough to report to you. Um, that being said, none of these give me overall concern or really much concern at all. Uh, the first two really result from very isolated, unique audit adjustments that we did have. I mentioned we had a couple of audit adjustments and those first two findings result from those. Um, I think those were, as we'll talk about them, um, pretty isolated, unique. The county was kind of doing really the best they could do with what they had at the time. Um, and so I, there, none, none of them really give me a lot of overall concern, but we just had to report them as findings, in particular those first two, because the, the audit adjustment that was created from them was significant. The first one relates to prior period capital assets. And in the past, the county received some external advice that um, certain of the road resurfacing expenditures needed to be uh, recorded as capital assets, whereas GAP would tell you unless the, the, the improvement extended the useful life of the road or extended the capacity of the road, then we should expense it uh, as it as it goes along. Um, and in, in this case, this resurfacing, did, you know, was really just allowing the road to achieve its, say, 50-year useful life that the county has on it. It wasn't extending the useful life of the road, and therefore it, it should have been expensed. But the county kind of had gotten some external advice that it was supposed to capitalize these and did so. Um, we didn't think that was right, and the county has kind of looked at it and agreed with us, and so we kind of wrote off $13.8 million of previously capitalized items by restating beginning net position. Um, and so while that is a large number, um, one thing to note is it doesn't affect the general fund or any of the funds. This is really only affects when you kind of pull all that together, go to the government-wide statements that are full accrual. Um, and so that's another reason that's something you do once a year. It's not something you track routinely. You're tracking capital assets routinely in a subledger, but you're recording them in your financial statements really essentially once a year uh, when you do the kind of financial statement preparation. So that's another reason this one doesn't really give me a lot of concern. If it were something where you were tracking something in a general fund, uh, expenditure or something was wrong routinely, that would be something I'd be more concerned with than something you do really essentially one time a year. You got some, some bad advice and followed it. Um, uh, it just doesn't give me a lot of concern, but the number is big, so as a result, we had to, to present it as a finding. The second finding there relates to the Greta Arterial Road Fund. It started the year 2017 with a deficit. It added a little bit to that deficit during the year to get to a little over $3 million. The county was using that capital projects fund to kind of segregate and, and um, account for these costs related to these projects uh, in, in one group in the hopes that the state or, or grant funding would fund a large part, if not all of those um, expenditures. And we kind of said, well, we should really know that at this point and we should kind of clean that up as of the end of 17 and figure out how much is going to be reimbursed versus how much isn't. So the county um, got together and worked with the state DOT to determine what amount is going to be funded by the state uh, and then what amount is not going to be. And so of the $3 million plus, dollars, um, $1.9 million of it is going to be funded by the by the state and we recorded a receivable from the state to um, record that uh, amount that they're going to fund and then the rest of it which ended up being 1.37 million we recorded as a transfer to take it out of the general fund to put it in the Greta Arterial Road Fund so that all that's left in the Greta Fund is what will be reimbursed this year by the state. Um, so again that's a pretty isolated case. I, I know why the county was segregating these costs and that they expected to recover them from grant funding. It's just a matter of kind of cut off and we recommending to clean it up as of the end of 2017 instead of allowing that to continue into 2018 and, and figuring it out. And then the last finding we have wasn't really an audit adjustment, but it um, deals with the constitutional officers to the various courts. Um, these courts have lots of different cash accounts where they collect things in a fiduciary capacity and they owe them out to lots of different people. They might hold something for a, a court case, they might hold, uh, collect fines, and then they owe some of it to the county, some of it to the state, some of it to all these different parts of the state, et cetera. Uh, and so theoretically, when we audit the cash balance, we should be able to see a detail of who they owe that entire cash balance to. 
Um, and then we did audit the cash balance, and the cash balance was fine. We felt good about the cash balance, no problems there. When we asked for who they owed all that money to, they were able to give us a listing, but it didn't add up to the full amount of the cash. And when you add all those courts together, at least as of now, there was $2.3 million that is, I don't want to say unaccounted for, it's accounted for, but they don't know who they owe it to. And we actually encountered this a lot at our county um, audits when we take over because a lot of people don't focus on this at, at these constitutional officers, don't ask for that due to, and we do. Uh, and so our recommendation as we take over county audits and find this at most all of them is that you give the, the courts and the different constitutional offices time because it takes time to go back and research. We just had to cut off and this was the amount that they could, or not prove, I guess, at the time we had to issue the report, but um, let them have some time to try to figure out, go back through historical records. A lot of turnovers happened there. Some of these are probably old balances that have just been there for a long time and nobody knows who they owe it to. And so we just want to give them some time and then once they've done their exhaustive search and they can't figure out any more, theoretically what you're supposed to do is just cheat that, that to the state problem is when you escheat property to the state, you have to tell them who you owe it to, and you don't know who you owe it to. So that's going to be a problem. So when that happens, we recommend that, that counties consult with their county attorney and turn, have the courts and, and fiduciary funds turn that over to the county general fund, and it just be revenue for the county general fund with the understanding that if anybody comes to the, the, the court and says, hey, you owe us money, can prove it, whatever, that the general fund will then have to repay it at that point in time. So it's just something for, for you to work with the, the constitutional officers and try to kind of get resolved to figure out what to do, how much we can discover and figure out who we owe that to or, or what to do with it. Uh, the rest of the, these uh, recommendations are we, we consider management points. Um, these were not things we considered significant. These are mostly kind of recommendations for improvement of accounting kind of things to do to make things run a little smoother or make the audit run a little smoother. Um, nothing that we would consider significant. Um, several of these relate to the constitutional officers and, and their offices. A couple of these relate to the county. Uh, we've discussed these um, with the county. Um, they they uh, know about them, uh, understand them, and have committed to kind of work internally and with the constitutional officers' offices to try to address each of them uh, in, the, in the coming year. All right, uh, the next couple of slides deal with GASB, which is the Government Accounting Standards Board, this who sets gap for governments. I really like talking about this stuff. I get that most people that I present to don't, so I'm not gonna spend time on this. I'll talk about one that deals with OPEB, which are post-employment healthcare benefits other than pensions. You provide that to your employees beginning in the year we're in now, the financial statements for 2018, that accounting is gonna be different and your liability will likely increase on the face of your financial statements. Won't affect the fund statements, but will affect that kind of full accrual government-wide statement and that liability under this new accounting mechanism is gonna go up as it is for all governments. Um, so I, that's just something that's going to occur in 2018. Um, because we like talking about GASB stuff, we offer free CPE to our government clients. You guys are welcome to come if you want to. Um, the county, we had one just a couple of weeks ago down the road in Douglasville. The finance department attended and we appreciated them coming. Um, but you guys, are, you can come, come too. We, we like talking about GASB stuff and internal controls and we talk about lots of different subjects, but we do offer that to our clients. Um, so that concludes my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions about the audit or anything that I can help with. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Black. Um, Commissioner Robinson, I believe you have a comment. You raise yep. your hand. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be brief. I'm, I want to go back to, uh, th first, thank you for, for joining us and becoming our, our auditor. You're now the high joker, um, in <laughs> essence. And, and I, I say that um, entering into the context of the, of the first findings. And, you know, I'm, I'm the, uh, I have the privilege um, of being the chairman of the Finance and Audit Committee. We don't say audit much, but I, I get to exercise that at this moment. Um, and your first finding about the difference between um, the capital, um, and, 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 and that was a, you mentioned we got prior advisement, um, staff got prior advisement from the, uh, another advisor. Really, that was our prior auditor. And I want to highlight that um, when you get advice from one auditor and you transition to a new one and they have different interpretation, we find ourselves where we are, where we, we have a finding. Um, I wanted to at least acknowledge um, that we believe that staff actually properly followed the advice of their auditor, which they should. But we also acknowledge now you have a different interpretation. It may be harder. It, it may be the difference between the left and the right. Um, it's just, it, it, it's a more 
letter of the law interpretation, which we acknowledge and we did accept. But I have to acknowledge that we do get it. But it, it's tough that you would think that everybody saw the law the same. They interpreted the law the same, but duly noted. I just want to acknowledge that. Second point I wanted to bring up is, um, I, again, regarding um, the Greta grant that you identified, and I guess 1.37, was that the amount that mm -hmm. came in at? That's something that we, um, and this is probably a more broader statement to the public, that um, there was a concern with reconciliation of, 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 of that fund. Um, and it just didn't flow right. Um, there was some inconsistency of reporting. And um, just when we thought we were going to declare to go in there and look at this in a more formalized manner, the auditor came in um, not even a week or two later saying, hey, there's an issue here. We, we've acknowledged that. We, we knew that there was something wrong there. I believe that operationally we've got the right leadership in place that we won't have this going forward, nor will we have. Uh, but we believe we have the processes in place. But it's something that we, we did have our minds around, and you, you confirmed it for us. But, but, but it was something that we, we took pride in to say we got it right. We knew that something was wrong, and thank you for that. The last point I'm going to bring up is um, I'm going to call it a lost and found fund. In other words, this is dealing with the judicial courts and everything that you mentioned, that there's this money out there that has aggregated over time. And Douglas County has historically, I mean, we've evolved. And we really, we're, we're going to a point where we've got to become more sophisticated in how we deal with things, process it, and we just sort of left it sitting there. But I appreciate the spirit of which our new auditors like, look, I got to deal with this. Cut it. Deal with it. Make a decision. Write it off. So that I do thank you. And so it's one of those like, ooh, what are we going to do with <laughs> 2.3 million? I don't know. We'll figure it out. But is there a time period in which we, and this is for the record, is there a time period that we set the courts, the sheriffs, and whomever's expectations, the clerks, that they got to have this resolved? That is this next month, end of year, next reporting period? Do you have a recommendation for us? Um, well, I, I guess two sides to that. One is if we don't get the amount down to something we wouldn't consider to be material, if it's not resolved in time for us to issue the 12, 31, and 2018 audited financial statements, which would be May, June of next year, then it will be a finding again. But kind of, I don't, there is no law here, I guess, but so there is no requirement that it be dealt with in a certain period of time, our experience is that it will take longer than maybe even a year for each of these offices to go through that process enough to feel comfortable that they've exhausted their resources. That doesn't mean it can't happen that quickly, but oftentimes this is something that might repeat for a year or two and just get less and less each year before you finally kind of have it down to a number that doesn't change for a while, a couple of months, and then, then you know that's the number that we can transfer over. So you said it's a it's not a law, but I'm hearing. But I don't. I guess we're trying to avoid having another formal finding next year because we didn't put the amount right amount of pressure expectations on them. Like, look, you need to resolve sure. this. Put the resources behind this. What do we need to do to help move this along? So I'm, I appreciate how you're you're delicately putting this out here. But at, you know, for the sake of our staff and for the broader public, I mean, we, we we're trying to get to this. I mean, we don't want to continue to be here. We're to your point. We didn't move it far enough or hard enough. Yeah. So, so in that case, 10 months from now, like April, early May of next year, it would have to be either resolved or down to a number significantly less than what it is right now. That's what I was looking for, 10 months. Okay, let it be rec recorded, Madam Chair, the expectations mm -hmm. on this. We'll take it back in finance. County Administrator, can you make a note of that? And with finance, Madam Chair, I yield. Yes, That's sir. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Moe here. Yeah, this is a, uh, a general question, not specific to Douglas County Sheriff's Department, but there's a, a comment here on decentralized accounting operations having to do with uh, law enforcement confiscated asset funds and and uh, law libraries. These these are things that are, are, are handled statewide. But obviously we have one budget. We have the county budget in which the Sheriff's Department is embedded uh, eventually. But uh, given the Sheriff's Department's uh, largely uh, autonomous role in, in operating the Sheriff's Department across the state, uh, what is the county's responsibility, uh, if any, in terms of seeing that these uh, law enforcement confiscated asset funds and district attorney funds and so forth are, are audited and, uh, and correct? What, what is the county's responsibility, if any? Sure, and, and I guess just to clarify, they were audited. We, we did audit them, and they're included in the county's financial statements. Our recommendation is more about 
the, the, all the accounting records are kept decentralized for these funds that are special revenue funds. Um, instead of at least running through quarterly or monthly or something like that through the central finance department. Right. And so when we get to the year end audit, instead of us getting a trial balance from the finance department, we've got to wait and kind of get something from different people from throughout the county. And so it's more, not that it's wrong, and certainly it's a delicate balance between the board of commissioners, a central That's finance department, yeah. and constitutional <laughs> officers. Yeah. We see that at every county. Yeah. And so it's more a recommendation and we see the whole spectrum you know, uh, it's just, just something that it, we've seen it work where there's more, maybe more communication. And I think your constitutional officers are actually pretty communicative and receptive. So I'm, I'm, I guess, hopeful that maybe they'll, they'll listen to this one as well. But if they would more routinely send kind of some kind of summary trial balance to central finance and it be kind of reconciled more routinely, then it would make the year end process go more smoothly. And that's really what our recommendation drives at. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Guider. Uh, yes, sir. Um, on the fund balance, uh, you're showing like 24.7 million, but that that includes both unassigned and assigned. Yes, ma'am. So uh, the uh, the larger part of that, or half of it at least, is assigned to other projects. So does this not kind of distort? Well, I, I guess it, it depends on how you look at it. Certainly, I mean, in our financials as they sit now, the unassigned fund balance is just a tick under $10 million. It's 9.975. Um, and so that's a lot different than 24.6 million, certainly. But when I'm evaluating two to three months worth and when comparing it to rating agencies, that's, we're looking at total fund balance. So if I were to give you an unassigned fund balance, maybe recommendation, it would be something less than that. So that's why I look at it that way, because it's kind of historical reference point before we allocated between unassigned and unassigned. Mm -hmm. We used to have unreserved and reserved and different kind of things like that. So um, I, I agree with you, well, unassigned well, that, well, that is important. That was the part but, that bothered me, because you were saying that we were three, two to three months reserved, and if you just use the net uh, unassigned amount, we're not, we're just a month. Uh, what, a couple of months or something like sure. that? Sure. Yeah. So and I, I was just confused why you use the combined unassigned and assigned uh, fund balance. Yeah, and that's just because we have his, we have more history with that, and so that's the, the number we're typically using. Um, typically with assignments, uh, y you can change your mind. It's not something that has to be that way. And so that's why I kind of tend well, to look some at some of it can, some of it can't. It's, it's dedicated. Uh, it is. Because you, like we have construction going on that we're, we're going to be paying out of that fund. It's kind of allocated. Uh, Certainly. But, but at some it, point. yeah, but like in, in the biggest part of your assigned fund balance in the general fund is 8.9 million. That's really for the budget for 2018. So if you look at it that way, that includes those expenditures. So part of that assignment is going to fund some of those expenditures. So in that way, yes, it's dedicated. You've already budgeted it, okay. um, but it is going to pay those expenditures. So that's why I, I tend to look at it in total, but certainly if there's a large amount in non-spendable or restricted, I don't worry as much about assigned, but and restricted is legal external requirements are making you spend it on something specific like a SPLOS or something like that. Um, if you had large amounts there, then maybe we could break that out. And we could even break that out next year and look at the different well, pieces. I just was kind of confused. Why sure, I understand. Both, uh, both the unassigned and assigned. And also on the uh, recognition of the grant revenue, uh, the Greta Arterial Road Fund. And, and I remember reading some minutes from the uh, uh, Transportation Committee, I guess it was. And um, so, a lot of that, I think, was because we anticipated some grant money. Maybe we let it lapse, the time period lapse, and then we lost the grant, so to speak. Uh, uh, I think some of it may have been that, but uh, are we taking steps to correct that? Will we have a timetable set up so we know that we have to do the work or, or renew the grant or whatever uh, have we done taken steps so this does not happen again i guess that's what i'm saying i guess i'll rather manage to answer that <laughs> I, I think i know the answer but <laughs> Uh, yes, ma'am, we have. Um, Miguel may be able to speak a little bit more about this than I would, but at the 
March or April when y'all went back to revisit the budget improvement request, there was a request for a transportation project analyst position to be placed in the DOT department. And that position, um, I believe, is being advertised at this moment. Is, um, is there software out there that does this, the uh, over-the-counter software type thing that we could buy? That it's, it's really a glorified spreadsheet is what it is. But for each project that you got going, you should have all this broken out. That you're going to be reimbursed for such and such, but you're not going to be reimbursed for this. And we know at the end of it, we're going to have to come up with that money. Um, so we had difficulty. I think it happened with the Highway Five. <laughs> yeah, we had some difficulty with the prior um, DOT director in getting direct information of what was being re what was considered reimbursable versus what was not reimbursable, um, and he would continuously be trying to contact GDOT to and be able to be informed to see how much was going to be reimbursed yeah. from the state. Uh, what I'm concerned with is, are we going to keep up with it from now on? Yes, so that uh, Miguel, I think, needs to come up here. I'd like to ask him to come up here <laughs> to him on the hot explain. Seat. I, I'm just asking, have yes, you, uh, have you pl put things in place so that we know what is not reimbursable and what will be reimbursable by the state. We, we certainly that? have, uh, and um, we are going to be tracking uh, whether we use software or what have you. We're going to have somebody who's dedicated to making sure that we understand what is reimbursable, what isn't, and what the timeline to be able to get that reimbursement is. So the goal is that that does not happen again. Now, with federal funds, uh, there is a timeline, uh, and uh, you have to make sure that you uh, do at the local level everything that you're supposed mm -hmm. to do, uh, following the proper protocol. Or you could uh, to lose ensure, it. Uh, or you, or could, you could lose it. Yes. So uh, the goal going forward is is not to lose any, and uh, to to be able to to know uh, on a daily basis, uh, uh, or at least have a reference that we can reference uh, whenever we need. Uh, uh, to uh, information on a particular project or just overall mm -hmm. that we have we know what is um, uh, what's been encumbered what's been designated as reimbursable yeah. and what is owed uh, but it's an exposure to the county that has to be uh, either paid out of the general fund or the spouse fund with whatever fund is as associated with that particular project so uh, again, we we have put uh, measures in place uh, to try very, very hard uh, for that not to happen again. Well, uh, <clears throat> my suggestion is that each project be assigned a project number and that all the funds for that project go in and out and you show where there's going to be a match or whatever, especially on right-of-way. I think right-of-ways uh, cause the a big problem because we didn't know that we had to pay for the right of ways right. yeah and that is a very good <coughs> suggestion and we intend to do that uh, in addition to the uh, uh, project by project we will have a composite uh, yes. report that indicates where we are relative I, to I think the before it was all on one big spreadsheet and, and you couldn't tell heads or tail where the money was coming from what project it was coming from and whatever all right thank you mm -hmm. Just want to make sure that we're doing something about it for the future. Certainly. <laughs> and then uh, your um, your comment about the unidentified funds and constitutional officers, I, I do know that there are circumstances that we have been told in the past, even by our auditor, that you've got all this money here and you can't do nothing with it. You know, it, it's it's almost like it's just on hold for eternity. <laughs> and uh, I can't remember what it, a lot of, of it was. I think it had something to do with some estates or something like that. I know condemnation money's paid into court and then the people have to make a claim for it and things like that. So a lot of it's out of our uh, the clerk's hands as far as uh, uh, how to 
dispense that money because, but you said something very interesting that we could put it in the general fund. Now that's the first I've ever heard that out of all these years, that we can put it in the general fund. However, if anybody ever does, you've got to keep a record of all that. So if they come up and they make a claim for it, then you've got to pay it out of the general fund. So certainly, and that's why I mean we recommend you <coughs> consult with your county attorney because there's legalities involved. But okay, well the law this, could have changed throughout sure, the years yeah, too. That's so, true. all right, well uh, that's nice to know that we've got 2.3 million. <laughs> <laughs> it might come down as they have more time. We just had to cut it off at a certain point, so they might develop a better list that brings that number down. But yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I yield back. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I agree with Madam uh, Guider that we definitely have to keep an eye on the Greta uh, Arterial Fund. Uh, however, I want to uh, just make it clear for the record that it is uh, this happened uh, before uh, Valentine, De Director Valentine's uh, tenure. So uh, this is something I believe in. If you could explain it to me, if I could have um, Director Hallman come forward for just a second, if you could come forward. I believe this, this problem originated a couple of years back, you know, just, is this a trend from a couple of years back, just to make it clear for the record that this is something that this administration had to pick up. So there's another hit to uh, the general fund, or should I say our unassigned fund, that I, I was really excited that we were at that 11.3 peak, now it's dropped to 9.9. .9. I just want to make it clear for the public that I'm doing all I can to hold the road, but every time I look around, there's something else new that's coming. Absolutely, this has been something that's been cumulative. Um, we were getting or have been getting all of the reimbursements for the right of way. Uh, what we have found, I had Michelle Green in my office kind of dig deeper and try to work with not only the prior DOT director, but our current one, uh, knowing that Miguel was um, kind of limited to his history of information um, and what we found was the right of way was getting reimbursed but there are certain and I don't know if I'm using the right terminology soft cost studies uh, preliminary engineering um, that were charged to that fund um, that were not reimbursable therefore two things should have happened either two things one um, at the time that it was charged to that fund it should have been brought and had a funding source attached to it, knowing that if it was charged to the Greta Fund, it was not reimbursable, we needed to have a funding source, or not charge it to the Greta Fund at all, and have it go into either the CTF, Capital Transportation Fund, or the General Fund. So this is something that's been cumulatively um, going on, that didn't happen just in 2017, and matter of fact, that most of the expenditures um, happened even prior to 17 or 16. Okay. But we, the good part, we have a plan going forward. And mm -hmm. thank you so mm -hmm. much. And uh, for you, uh, Mr. Blackhead, just one comment we discussed yesterday about the inventory year in uh, counts for the fleet parts inventory uh, for their inventory. And, uh, I suggested cycle counts. If you could just expound a little bit about that, and you say you may recommend that to sure, the sure. department. I, I think that, that cycle counts is something that would help the year end inventory. I mean, the management point really talked about the year end inventory was performed as of January 28th. So the main recommendation is that we just at least do the, the year end count close to year end, uh, the annual count close to year end. But uh, at your suggestion, would cycle counts be a, a, a better idea, an even better idea? And certainly I think that that would be uh, help that process. It would help every, the, the year end count would be much more smooth because you would have cycle counted things throughout the year and adjusted them and you wouldn't have as many adjustments and would make that year end count go pretty easily and smooth. So, um, you know, at a large inventory facility, I think it certainly is something that might even be necessary. Your size necessary might be strong, but I do would recommend it as kind of a best practice and would certainly make it easier to, to do the year end count. Thank you, uh, Mr. Black. We appreciate your uh, presentation today and this audit is definitely an eye opener for us and we appreciate you taking the time and you and your firm. Uh, and we look forward to working with you real thank, soon. Thank you. We did too. And, and even though we had a couple of findings, I, it, as first year audits go, we typically have, I don't want to say typically, we a lot of times have a lot of restatements. We only had the one this year with you guys. So I, I think that the finance department here does a really good job, even though we did have a, a couple of findings. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the approval of the minutes. 
You have the minutes of the commission meeting of June 5th, 2018, and the work session and the executive session, minutes of June 4th, 2018. Are there any corrections, additions, or deletions that need to be made? No, ma'am. Being none, the minutes stand approved as presented. <clears throat> Uh, tab number four, we have a new business item today, tonight, and it is authorization for the county administrator to allow the contract of Amanda Bryant to expire on June 30th, 2018, and pay the 30-day obligation pursuant to the terms thereof. Board of Commissioners, uh, do we have a motion to approve this authorization for the county administrator to allow the contract of Amanda Bryant to expire? on June 30th. We do not have a motion. Okay, uh, I'll try one more time. If not, we'll just table. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to approve? At this time, I would like to make a motion to table. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All, any discussion? We have a motion and a second to table. All in favor, please cast your votes. Do we, can we do that? Can we to table or either, all in motion mm -hmm. for the tables, please say aye. 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 Okay, so we have four to carry. This item has been tabled and we'll come back to discuss. All right, the consent agenda is next. And um, I will read the agenda, but Madam I won't. Chair, yes. Mm -hmm. Put one point. Yes. Madam Chair, can we pull out number 15? 15, okay. Um, outside the consent agenda. Okay. Madam Chair, we have one, two corrections to make before you read it. Yes. Um, legal counsel. You yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, yesterday, y'all authorized us to separate an item that's now marked as 11 and 12. And I just want to make sure the record's clear when y'all vote on this consent agenda, if y'all vote to approve. The item 11, the word the, it reads authorization to consider. The recommendation from staff was to approve, so we're changing the word consider to approve. So to read item 11, authorization to approve a proposed change to the merit system recommended by the personnel review board, board regarding section 13146, county dress code, and a proposed change to the merit system recommended by the board of commissioners regarding section 13122, parens B, parens closed holidays. Okay. With respect to 12, which is added as a result of our uh, direct discussions during the open session yesterday, uh, I inadvertently, probably due to the fog in my glasses, wrote a wrong code section, so I'll take responsibility for this, where it says in brackets and related to section 13, where's your mark? Related to th in front of me. I'm sorry, related to uh, section 1333, it should read and related to section 13-41 and 13-40 parents close. So the item 12 would read authorization to deny proposed change to the merit system recommended by the personnel review board regarding section 1337 composition parents and related to section 13-41 and 13-40 parents close regarding pay steps due to promotion or demotion, period. Those, those two corrections come from legal, and I apologize. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney Bernard. Okay, and what item did you want removed separately? Was it 15? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we'll just place that as a business item. Okay. And what I'll do is just to make some adjustments here. We'll start with 15 as the business item. Uh, do we have a motion to uh, change or tab number 15 to a business item? So moved. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Okay, and the motion carries. Uh, I'll start with our new business item, which is tab number 15. Uh, authorization to issue an invitation to bid for sports lighting for three athletic fields at uh, Fair Play Park to be reimbursed through the 2016 SPLOS funds if funds are available as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee. Do we have a motion? You said the clarity. Okay. Ma Madam Chair, if, if, if Director Dukes and Director Hallman can come down and give a little clarity of what this was about. Thanks, okay. Madam, before we. Thank you. 
Director Hallman and Director Dukes, if you could just provide some clarity. Good evening. <laughs> Not sure which it is. Uh, yes, ma'am. These fields uh, at Fair Play are probably 40 years old. Uh, mm. They were done back when volunteers did them. Uh, somebody donated poles. You know, somebody did the wiring. Uh, to make a long story short, the fields are in bad repair. Uh, the poles have suffered. Uh, rotting at the top. The conduits have rusted and come loose from the poles. The wiring has cracked, which allows water to get down into the electrical system. And uh, I brought that before the Recreation Committee, and they recommended that we go ahead and replace it. Okay. You have any comments, uh, Director Hallman, before we proceed with the motion? Yes, if, if you don't mind, I'd just like to read the Finance Committee's recommendation, which differed a little bit from the Parks and Recreation Committee, Oversight Committee. It'll kind of give you a little bit of a history. Um, during Monday's work sessions on June 18th, the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee recommended to replace the lighting at Fair Play Park due to a safety issue. This is a SPLOS project that was originally programmed to be completed later However, due to the safety issue, it is being recommended to be completed now. The recommendation stipulates funding from the general fund with potential reimbursement from the SPLOST when the program reaches, reaches this project. Since this has a possible financial impact to the general fund, Commissioner Robinson requested the Finance Committee to discuss and bring a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners regarding the funding for this project. Due to the emergency situation and safety issue of this project, the Finance Committee recommends the Board of Commissioners amend the SPLOST priority list by moving the SPLOST project up in the priority list and use SPLOST funds instead of using the general fund. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time to share that with us. Um, Board of Commissioners, you have heard um, the, the reason why this is so important uh, that we move forward with these, uh, this item for Fair Play Park. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? So move. Okay. Uh, second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Com Commissioner uh, yes, Robinson? Yes, Madam Chair. I want to declare that we're, what we're accepting is the recommendation of the Finance Committee. Is that what we're agreeing to, or what was the recommendation to proceed with this being reimbursed through the 2016 SPLOS bonds? M Madam Chair, uh, uh, if I may, mm -hmm. based on the agenda item, if that is the motion, y'all need to vote by hand or orally, not by ballot cast, because that's not how the agenda item reads. Okay. Yeah. Madam Chair, as a point of clarity, um, whoever the, the, can the thank you. Whoever is carrying this motion, can y'all clarify which position you're taking, either what was recommended by the um, Parks and Rec Committee as is or as the Finance Committee came back as a recommendation? I think that's material. I, I make the motion that we go by the recommendation from the Finance Committee and take it out, just change the priority list in the SPLOSH uh, program. Second. Second. Okay. That's the motion. That's the second. Okay. okay. Right. Okay, you finished with your discussion? Yes, ma'am. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 So it's four. A unanimous vote. So thank you so much. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> just, just as a clarity, I, I, I just stand strongly uh, with um, Commissioner Guider on this one, and it, it, this is a good dovetail behind the conversation that we just had with our auditor but also a narrative that went forth yesterday during our uh, work session, which is you, you've got to be steady, and there is a floor to the spend. And you don't have to spend everything, all right, regarding the SPLOS, but there is a time where there's emergency. Um, our children are exposed. I, I, I personally um, don't disagree with the need to move on this, but I think it's a function of reprioritizing what we've got in play already. So 
Um, and at the same point, since we have a funding source that you provided for us, um, I, uh, it was recommended out of the Finance Committee that we avoid using that general fund. And again, we've got to be careful. We, we had to clean up a lot of stuff here recently. We had to go and make adjustments and fall on the sword on this. And so I, I think it was one of those where we, we were at the bottom of what we can absorb and stay safely within a, as the auditor stated. So I think it was, Madam Chair, it was the right decision and I, I stand strongly with my peers. I yield. All right, thank you. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners before I go into the consent agenda? Okay, thank you. Please note all, that all the items are subject to final re review. Uh, that's listed under the consent agenda. <laughs> And I'll start with uh, tab number five. Tab number five is authorization to approve tax exempt financing for Douglas Village Apartments and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Tab number six is authorization for the chairman to execute a memorandum of understanding between Douglas County and Douglas Corps for mental health services for 2018 subject to final legal review. Tab number seven, authorization to accept grant funds in the amount of $88,827.99 with a match of $9,869.78 from CJCC for the DUI drug court for the period of July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Tab number eight, authorization to enter into a professional service agreement with 108 Forensics Incorporation and Matthew Durden for uh, drug screening services for the DUI drug court to be funded through date bonds and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Tab number nine, authorization to accept the family connection grant in the amount of $50,000 for the period of July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Tab number 10, author authorization to apply for the fiscal year 2018 drug treatment court program, grant program to enhance our family treatment court up to $900,000 over a 48 month period with a 25% match and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Tab number 11, authorization to approve a proposed change to the merit system recommended by the Personnel Review Board uh, regarding section 13-146 county dress code and a proposed change to the merit system recommended by the Board of Commissioners regarding section 13-122 parentheses B holidays. Tab number 12, authorization to deny a proposed change to the merit system recommended by the Personnel Review Board regarding section 1337 composition and related to section 1333, what 1341, excuse me, and 13-40 regarding pay steps due to uh, promotion or demotion. Tab number 13, authorization to amend the Sheriff's Office budget in the amount of $20,000 for increased sheriff's fees to be used to clean the indoor range facility and dispose of lead material. Tab number 14, authorization to increase the county's contribution to the teacher's retirement for cooperative extension employees in the amount of $1,866.30 for this year and amend the budget. Tab number 15, Authorization to issue an invitation to bid for construction of the Boundary Waters, Waters Park concession stand press box to be funded through the 2016 splash bonds as recommended by the Parks, Recreation, and Oversight Committee. Madam Chair, because 15 was taken out, that was actually item 16. Okay. There we go. I apologize. That was tab number 17. Authorization to use the 2016 Splash Equipment Funds in the amount of $9,900 for the purchase of a zero turn more for the Parks and Recreation Maintenance Division as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee. Tab number 18, authorization to approve a change order with Motorola Solutions Incorporated to allow for changes to be made to equipment our requirements to the public safety radio system funded through 2016 SPLOS funds and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. And tab number 19, authorization to enter into contract negotiations with Atlantic Coast Consultant to provide on-call landfill engineering 
and environmental consulting services, including task orders provided funds and paid out to enterprise funds and are within the 2018 budgeted amount and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. And tab number 20, authorization to award a contract to CW Matthews contra uh, Contracting Company for the patching, milling, and resurfacing of various Douglas County roads for a total cost not to exceed $2,392,688.88 to be funded out of the 2016 SPLOS resurfacing category and authorize the chairman to uh, sign all related documents pending final legal review. That concludes our consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on any particular item? Madam Chair. I had both y'all said it's something. Madam Chair. I'll yield to him. Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner uh, Moke here. I'm not going to call uh, Director Valentine up here. I'm just going to read this for him. Uh, I would like to read into the record uh, the roads that are going to be resurfaced. Item 20. Well, if you want to read them, that's fine. <laughs> I, I may have uh, not been clear. Okay. Uh, these are the roads that are going to be uh, paved in the 2018 SPLOS resurfacing uh, pro project. Uh, Cave Springs Road from State Route 92 to Cedar Mountain Road, District 1, 1.97 miles. South Sweetwater Road from U.S. 78 to Lee Road, District 1, 1.03 miles. Thornton Way from Skyview Drive to Thornton Road, District 2, 0.4 miles. Midway Road from U.S. 78 to Pope Road, District 2, 2.35 miles. Big A Road from Kings Highway to State Route 166, District 3, 2.23 miles. Kilroy Lane from Highway 5 to Big A Road, District 3, 1.65 miles. North Helton Road from Post Road to Liberty Road, District 4, 1.99 miles. South Flat Rock Road from Cedar Mountain to the city limits, District 4, 0.97 miles for a total of 12.59 miles. And I've read that for the viewing public. I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Moak here. Any other uh, questions from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Robinson? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just gonna double back to number six about mental health. And this, this has been a three-year um, walk when we first introduced this to the county and began to pursue it. I always try to um, give acknowledgement that um, there's two parts to mental health and, and our model that we're adjusting. We know there's a more holistic, broader model uh, that academia embraces um, that has nine points to it, but we're starting with just two. Um, the first is prevention, the other is intervention. The prevention deals with education and awareness that there's actually a, a problem. We recognize and admit that something may be going on in our minds. Um, it happens in our neighborhoods, it happens in our families, it could happen within ourselves. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's chronic, it could be seasonal, but it's something that do, we do recognize and it has a broader impact on society. No one's exempt. Um, it's easy to talk about our physical health, but we also recognize that our mental, um, though it had been in times past taboo, we recognize everything from royalty to just the average citizen um, may experience it. And so people, um, and I'm encouraged to see that we're talking about it. So um, that's one part. The other part is intervention. Um, and I, again, I always applaud our, our judicial side, Judge Bo McLean, and now Judge Peggy Walker with Juvenile, recognizing that there's issues that go on, issues that may deal with us on that side of the hall, as we say, or across the way, that everybody doesn't need to be in the jail. Everybody is not evil. And so we recognize, and it's been acknowledged by both sheriffs, the prior sheriff and our current sheriff, that over somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the people there don't need to belong there. We recognize we have no place to put them, per se. There's no more hospitals. There's no more um, psych wards and stuff. So the jail is becoming the mental health ward of, of the local. 
Uh, we know the feds got out the game. We know the state is pushing it down with um, unfunded mandates. But nevertheless, we're willing to step up and begin to deal with it one citizen at a time. Um, this is our one part. This 50,000 grant is a way for us to sort of acknowledge that let's go out here and make people aware. So um, this is the second time that we've given out $50,000. This appropriation was done um, through this board, which I thank um, wholeheartedly. Um, it is uh, being administered by the core um, um, that we just talked about a little bit earlier. Core is responsible for administering it to sub grantees. There were three sub grantees last year: um, um, Heart Matters, Share House, and PEP. And they tackle different areas um, in which their footprint fits. And we appreciate their work. They're going to repeat that again. So half the grant would go back to the same program and services, touching the people at the grassroots, providing people with counseling and day-to-day -day. people were indigent, uh, they can't afford, uh, they don't have insurance, and so we make sure they get that. But the other part of the grant um, that they've acknowledged is that there's an issue of suicide. And so I put, I put a condition in this year's grant that says, okay, the second 25,000 must be dedicated to suicide. All right, if you notice, uh, a couple of weeks ago, our coroner was before us and put a, a very good slide up that dealt with um, the types of deaths that were occurring in Douglas County. And if you look at the last two or three years, you saw a spike, not just in perhaps the, the, you know, the capital of, of, of murder, but you also saw suicide. So those that inflicted upon ourselves and those who were self-inflicted. And that bothered me. And it's like, okay, we, ne we need to get on that. And so also we were encouraged as part of this, um, not as a, a, a condition, but it was an optional consideration to work with the school system to be preventative. Um, those teenagers, those tweens, all the way up to those young adults um, are an exposed group that we think needs to be looked at. Not that our seniors, not the people my age or anybody else is not, but we want to be a little bit more preventative because with the social media bullying that's going on, a lot of things are out there that, that some of us in my age like are less exempt, you know, exposed to or, or culpable for. We know that it, it's an issue. So we put a condition in there to make sure we dealt with suicide as a deliberate act, and, but we gave them plenty of leeway to deal with it. So again, sorry to take so long on this, but it's something that's long in coming. We know if we can deal with mental health, we can sort of offset some of the costs of people being over in the jail that don't need to be there, or we can maybe save a life, save a family, et cetera. So again, it's a small pebble. We recognize we put way more money over there in mental health as it relates to housing with Judge McLean and some of the services and intervention, as well as the big grant we gave um, Peggy Walker dealing with juvenile at 125. But it's a start. And um, I thank the Board of Commissioners for doing this. And on behalf of CORE, I'm sure they would thank you as well. I yield. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. We'll move forward. Um, we have a motion and a second. Um, please prepare to cast your votes. Finally, we have a chance to use the automated system for that. <laughs> All the votes have been cast. It's a unanimous vote, four to zero, so thank you, passed. Uh, next, we have the approval of our expenses. Board of Commissioners, I know you had an opportunity to look at our expenses for the month, and so uh, at this point, do we have a motion to approve your expenses? So the, moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion regarding any of the expenses? Okay, with that being said, we have a motion and a second. Please prepare to cast your votes and cast your votes about the approval of this, uh, of our expenses. We have a four to zero pass. That's a unanimous, uh, a unanimous vote. Thank you all so much, and the motion carries. I would like our uh, communications director, please come forth. If you could just read our announcements for tonight, we really appreciate it. Mr. Rick Martin, thank you so much. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board of Commissioners and Good evening. staff. Good evening. Uh, for this evening's announcements, um, just yesterday at our work session, the community opened houses for public input uh, on transportation services, including uh, fixed proposed bus routes um, was announced to occur in each of the four district commissioners. Um, and I can announce um, the locations as well. Uh, beginning tomorrow, I should say, and I'll go into timeline, beginning tomorrow, uh, Commissioner, Vice Chair Commissioner Kelly Robinson's District 2 is hosting a community open house. 
uh, to be held at Derelict Park, the Recreation Center at 2105 Mack Road, Douglasville. Uh, that is tomorrow, Wednesday, June 20th at six o'clock until eight o'clock. The next one in District 4, Commissioner Ann jones Guider, uh, Thursday, June 21st from 5.30 to 7.30 to be held at the Dog River Public Library located at 6100 Highway 5 in Douglasville. Uh, on the 25th of June, Commissioner Henry Mitchell's District 1 will be hosting its community open house for public input at 6.30 p.m. from 6.30 until 8 o'clock, held at Cornerstone Baptist Church, located at 7167 South Sweetwater Road in Lithia Springs. And last but not least, in District 3, Commissioner Mulcair will be holding one. Though it says tentative here, it is confirmed for Wednesday, June 27th, held at the Murray Educational Annex, located at 4841 Bill Arp Road, Douglasville. These are all open. Um, citizens are encouraged to come and uh, attend any time throughout the hours announced. Moving on, there will be a post-traumatic stress disorder awareness information session on June 27th at 6.30 here in Citizens Hall. The session will be facilitated by Dr. Felicia, Felicia Barry Mitchell as part of her community mental health engagement sessions. Uh, for further information, anyone can contact uh, Director of External Affairs, Tiffany Stewart Stanley. Uh, the External Affairs Department is continuing to accept applications for the Douglas County Citizens Academy through June 27th. The Citizens Academy is a 10-week interactive program offered once a year that encourages civic engagement and enhances dialogue between county officials and citizens. The Citizens Academy meets once a week on Tuesday evenings from July 10th through September 11th. For more information, anyone can contact the External Affairs Department. That'll be all for this evening's announcements. Thank you. Thank you, Director Martin. We appreciate you taking the time to just uh, provide what's go going on in our community and, and also just keeping us informed and prepared to attend all these uh, uh, various uh, engagements throughout the community. With that being said, Board of Commissioners, do you have any other comments or uh, Commissioner Guider that you all you uh, have? I would just like to reiterate that this is not a two-hour meeting uh, event. Uh, there is like a drop-in, and you take a survey, and you, you go on home. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I did notice on Mike Mulcair, you don't have a time. Uh, on your... Uh, Six to eight. Six to eight. Okay, it's left off of here, and I was just wondering. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I yield back. Just to reiterate, um, Commissioner Mulcair's, uh, which is in District 3, meeting will be held at Mary, Murray Educational Annex, located at 4841 Bill Arp Road in Douglasville, Georgia, on June 27th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, with that being said, uh, if we don't have any other uh, contributions tonight, uh, Board of Commissioners, um, again, thank you all uh, citizens of Douglas County for participating in county government. And uh, with this agenda, agenda being satisfied, this meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.